Each and every day enjoy the simple six menu at Subway. An entire made-for-you meal featuring one of six six-inch sandwiches like the Italian BMT or Black Forest Ham. With any bag of chips and a 21-ounce drink, all for only $6. Subway. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. We are taping this on a Monday. It is running Tuesday. On the phone line right now, the busiest man in America. This is his week. This is when he gets stretched in every which way by the Bristol machine. Chad Ford, how are you? What's going on, Bill? Um, probably the worst draft in 13 years. That's what's going on. Some people are now <laughs> trying to talk themselves into this draft not being as bad as people seem to think it is. Where do you stand? I just think what's your definition of bad? If your definition of bad is that there are no franchise players or surefire all-stars, this draft is horrible. If your definition of bad is that there aren't quality players in the draft. Uh, I think that's a misnomer. I actually think that the middle part of this draft is very solid. I think there'll be a lot of rotation players in this draft and, and that the overall sense of the draft will be, you know, there's no LeBron James's, there's no probably even Anthony Davis's here, but there'll be a lot of guys that play in the league a long time and help teams. And, you know, so I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, because I understand what fans want is that guy, that savior that comes in and turns our team around. And I just don't think that guy's there. In fact, you know, I was talking to a, a cab source last night and, you know, he made the comment, everybody keeps talking about, well, what is our fit or, you know, need, we need a small forward or whatever. They don't view any single player in this draft as capable of starting for them on their roster next year. Wow. And so, you know, every single, you know, they've got Barajal at the five. They've got Tristan Thompson at the four. They have an opening at small forward, but they have $22 million in cap room, and it's clear from almost every trade rumor that they are targeting a veteran small forward for that position. They have Deion Waiters at the two. They have Kyrie Irving um, at the one. They are not looking at this draft and they don't see anybody that says, Oh my goodness, this guy's going to start and help propel us to the playoffs. And so they're looking at a guy that's coming off the bench and uh, you know, how many number one picks in the draft um, can you think of that maybe play the whole season coming off the bench? It's funny. Cause you could argue that that might be Nerland's Noel's best destiny for these next couple of years, right? Like it's just an awesome energy guy off the bench. I actually think that that moves the conversation of everything I've heard. And look from maybe, maybe this will change by Tuesday by the time this runs, but from everything I've heard, the Cavs have not made their decision. They're, they've, they've narrowed the field down. They're looking at a couple of guys. Um, they're, they're not tipping their hands. I think all these internet reports that are saying it's this guy or that guy or the other are, are red herrings that are out there and, you know, usually propelled sort of by agents. I think that that was the first thing that I heard that made me feel more comfortable about Nerland Noel being the number one guy, because if you're viewing the draft that way, and why not bring the guy off the bench that has the most upside of it a couple of years turning into a guy when Barjell's contract's up or whatever that can step into the starting lineup and be awesome. You can afford to be patient. And right. uh, if you can afford to be patient, I think you take Nerland's Noel. If you cannot, then he's probably the worst of the six picks uh, to take because I just don't think he's going to give you a lot, especially his rookie year. My fee. This is stupid because you shouldn't think this way just because you're drafting one versus you're, when you're drafting two. 
But I think it's really scary to take somebody one overall when you have health questions about them. And with Nerlens Noel, what do you know about his injury history? Because it wasn't just this torn ACL, but he had that growth plate thing when he was in high school. Those are two red flags for me. Yeah, look, I've heard a lot of people wringing their hands about it. Uh, I've talked to Noel's doctor. I've talked to um, Cavs sources on this. Uh, Noel actually said last night on Sunday night uh, that the Cleveland doctor, team doctor, had cleared him, um, that they'd greenlit the Cavs to go ahead and draft him if that was their choice. Uh, and their their doctor is one of the leading um, knee surgeons in the country. Uh, I think that what I hear is that he's ahead of schedule on his rehab. His rehab is going to be fine. The growth plate was an issue years ago, but it's not now. No one thinks that it contributed to the, the torn ACL. And that while having torn an ACL isn't a great thing, given our modern surgical techniques and the age in which he tore it, there's all the reason to believe that he can come back at, at full strength. And, and by the way, if it's going to be Alex Lynn, he has a stress fracture in his ankle. If it's going to be Anthony Bennett, he's, you know, had a, had soldier surgery and uh, has struggled with that um, in, in his life. Those are the three bigs in the draft. Yeah. I, I think, Look, if there was a clear number one guy that didn't have an injury issue, yeah, I would take him. I mean, that would be the deciding factor for me. Uh, but I don't see the other guys, Otto Porter, Ben McLemore, Victor Oladipo, who I, who I personally love and is probably my favorite player in the draft. So I can understand why he wouldn't be the guy for Cleveland, uh, given their roster and the direction that they're going. I can understand why they're looking at the bigs. Uh, I, I just don't think it's enough to disqualify Noel. You know who I would take? Number would one. You take? Oh. Well, you've known me now. You've known me for a lot of years. You know how yeah. I think. Who would I take if I were the Cleveland Cavaliers with the first pick? With the first pick? I know you love Oladipo. I would take uh, Oladipo. I know, you... I, yeah. I know what yeah. I'm getting with Oladipo. The worst yeah. case scenario for Victor Oladipo is that he's going to be a better Tony Allen. That's his worst case scenario. His yeah, best case scenario is he could end up being – Jalen and I were trying to come up we're, for the draft because we're on the draft. We're coming up with, like, best and worst comparisons for each guy. Best case scenario, worst case scenario. His best case scenario could be a cross between, like, Alvin Robertson and Joe Dumars, right? Wow. This is somebody that could wow. be a, a destructive two-guard. He could be the best defender in the league at that position. He's a great athlete. If he develops three-point range, like – I don't know if you met him, but we, we got to interview all these guys. The three most impressive guys we interviewed were him, Trey Burke, CJ McCollum. Old Depot was just really, really, really super impressive, hard worker. I don't think he gives a crap about anything other than trying to go out and win games. And I thought he got better at Indiana. I like the pressure that he played in last year. I think that helps him. I know what he is. I know how he translates to the NBA. And then if you look at what, what Cleveland has, the fact that they have Deion Waiters shouldn't scare them off of Oladipo. Because if anything, De- Deion Waiters' destiny, if you had a great team, I feel like his destiny would be as the third guard slash instant offense off the bench. I'd rather have the backcourt of Kyrie Irving and Oladipo. And then I have Deion Waiters as my third guard. Like, boom, there's my backcourt for the next 10 years. You know, uh, I, I Noel scares me. I, I don't like the two injuries and I, I don't. I'm not positive what he is. Like I had somebody, um, somebody, I always try to figure out who somebody is compared to people in the past. And uh, a friend of mine said, well, he can be Theo Ratliff. I'm like, oh, that's good. Theo Ratliff had a good career. Like I could see that. Um, But if that's like your upside, I don't, it's not like you're turning down a multi-time all-star here. I, I just feel safer with Oladipo. The Cavs are really building something here. I wouldn't roll the dice with that pick. Well, look, if it was, I agree with everything, first of all, that you said about Oladipo. And, uh, and I actually think secretly so many NBA guys in the league do. We just did this, uh, we just ran this thing on, on Insider. It was where great. I actually twisted the arms of a lot of people to rank 
the top 50 plays. They did it anonymously, so I don't know which, which GM or scout pick, picked where or how. Um, but we got them to rank these guys. Oladipo came out one, and he came out one, even though he didn't get a 10 ranking from anybody, but his range was 9 to 7. Everybody, not one person had him, gave him a number below 7. Erlen's Noel got a 3 or a 4, I can't remember, a 3 or a 4 um, from one team. Uh, Lynn got a four um, from one team. I mean, he was the guy. There was no no fear at all that he wasn't going to make it in the league. He's the surest thing. I also talked with all these guys. He, to me, was the most impressive basketball player. C.J. McCollum, a little bit more articulate and, and just really fun to talk to. Very engaging, very intelligent. Oladipo has that intensity yep. uh, in the way that, that he talks to you. You know, I've heard a number of GMs refer to, refer to it as he has that it factor, that X totally factor, agree. and a personality that reminds you a little bit of Dwayne Wade. It reminds you, it's sort of like when he's looking at you, he's trying to kind of, he's nice, but he's also trying to figure out how to kill you uh, I, at the same we, time. We, we could feel it in the room. We spent like, and that video's online if you haven't seen it yet, but I thought he was so impressive. And my favorite answer, we, you know, we're asking these guys goofy questions and we asked them like, all right, you're in South Beach. What do you do that you're in South Beach for the first time with uh, your new NBA team? What do you do that night? And he's just like, nothing. I got to guard LeBron James the next day. And it wasn't like an act. It wasn't like he'd been coached to say that. Like, I think that's how he honestly thinks. Um, and then, the, you know, we've talked about this before on the pod. We've done this pod, I think, every year, um, the week of the draft, probably six, seven straight years. I, I always judge these guys by what I just watched in the finals and the intensity with how everybody's playing, especially like what we just saw in game six and seven, where it became like, it wasn't just a basketball game. This was like, you know, just guys at another level of caring and trying and committing and physicality and everything. And I, if I'm Cleveland and I have Kyrie Irving and I really have a chance to contend potentially with all this cap space, I want somebody who could have played in that series. And Oladipo could have played in that series. He's tough enough. He could have been there athletically. And uh, I just think they should take him. I've been wrong before. I've been right a couple times. Uh, who knows how this is going to turn out. But I, I, he's the safest pick. And uh, I just don't think you can go wrong with him. And it, the one thing I disagreed with, you, you had the tears, which I love. I love when you do the tears. You're right. There's no superstar in this draft. Tier one should have been empty. Tier two, you said that that was also empty. There's no potential all stars. I think Oladipo could. I think potentially he could be an all star. I think it's too early to write him off for that because he's only 20. He's a phenomenal athlete. He got noticeably better last year. And uh, I, I, when you think about how few good two guards there are in the league and what a barren position that is, I think uh, I, I think he has a chance. Well, look, tier two are guys that we are confident will be all-stars, not, not guys that could be all-stars. That's why he wasn't there. You know, guys that you would say, yeah, I'm really confident this guy will be an all-star at some point in his career. I think I, I'm not 100% sure with that as Oladipo. Here's the last couple things I'd say about Oladipo. One, whatever his feeling is, I am confident he will max it out. And, and really what we're arguing about a little bit and what you know, teams will argue about is what exactly is his ceiling. But I don't think anyone doubts that whatever that is, he will max it out um, because he's that type of player. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, that, 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 that's one thing I think strongly uh, in Old Depot's uh, favor. The other thing is personality-wise, who he reminds me of in the draft the last couple of years was Kawhi Leonard. Mm. Uh, Kawhi Leonard had very similar gym rat, always in the gym, could not get him out of the gym. Just no nonsense, no goofing around. A hundred percent, I want to play basketball and I want to get better at playing basketball. And the difference, Leonard's different, they're different types of players, but they have that intense focus and that love of the game and that desire to win that I think everyone got introduced to Kawhi Leonard in the finals and what a great player he's going to be. Victor Oladipo has more athletic skills, uh, more physically. He's a better athlete than Kawhi Leonard. And so I think his ceiling is a little bit higher, but I wanted to send Noel on one thing. He's the third youngest player in this draft. 
Yep. The third youngest player in this draft. And he was getting better and better as the season went on. If you watched him in the Maryland game, the first game of the season, Alex Len destroyed him uh, in that game. But if you were watching him in late January, early February, you saw this kid getting it. And he, one thing I'll say, he has a motor. For a big man who's an athlete, the guy plays hard. He tore his ACL chasing down a player on the fast break. He was the only guy back for Kentucky. Uh, he is intelligent. Noel is not one of these guys that doesn't love playing basketball, but he's highly intelligent. He likes the game. Kalapari raves about coaching him, working with him. He's a sponge. I think he's going to work on his game and get better. I think he brings athleticism and intensity to his game. And I don't know what kind of player he's going to be. I think he's very hard to comp out. But if he ever gets any offensive game, if he ever gets that jump shot going a little bit, I know this is going to be blasphemy a little bit to say this, but when Kevin Garnett came into the league as a young high school player, he didn't really have much of a game other than being long, athletic, and intense. Uh, and over his career, he developed a killer, and everybody said, why, the guy's so skinny. He was as skinny as Nerland's Noel. He can't play center. He played center in high school, but he can never play center in the NBA. And he was so intense and wanted to improve that he developed that jump shot and then, you know, everything else that Kevin Garnett. I'm not saying he'll be as good as Kevin Garnett, but I also want to say there is precedent for long athletic players with great motors who are intelligent of making a transition to a different style of play in the NBA and being successful. I like the fact that he's lefty. I, I think that really, buy, especially with a big man, I think that buys you a couple of plays a game because these guys always forget they're guarding somebody who's lefty. And, you know, for somebody, he, he takes a lot of heat for that. He has no offensive game whatsoever, all this stuff. He actually has a pretty sneaky drive from top of the key to the rim. You know, he, he, he only goes left, but he can get to from the top of the key to the rim pretty well. And, and I think that's something he'd get better at. He plays around the rim. Obviously he's going to get as a pro. It's pretty easy to see what the upside is for him. Um, and, a lot and, of follow up dunks, rebounding block shots, like defensively doing what Serge Ibaka did for Oklahoma City these last couple of years. Like that's his destiny early, I think. And he averaged two steals a game. Uh, yep. which is phenomenal for a big man, averaged 2.1 steals a game uh, as a freshman. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is, you know, everybody's saying, well, Alex Len is so much more polished offensively. Uh, and all Noel did was dunk. 30%, 36% of Noel's shots were two-point shots, not at the rim. And he shot a 37% from there, which isn't great. Um, but Alex Len shot 32% on his two-point shots. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, I think people forget how young he is. He was born in 1994. He wow. just turned 19 years old. There's only two other players in the draft that are still 18 years old. Archie Goodwin out of, out of Kentucky and Giannis Antetokounmpo, the Greek kid. Uh, that's that my dude. To those are, those are it. My, and, that's my, my dude is the Greek dude. I'm in on him. I don't care. I, I saw the YouTube clips of him dominating the, uh, eighth grade CYO team and I was impressed. I thought he crushed him. He's great. Ben, ben McLemore is two years older. Uh, you know, than he is. Shabazz Muhammad, two years older than Nerland's Noel. Wow. Uh, at least, he's, I, I at least he's two years older. You've got to factor that in and not pretend that somehow you're comparing guys that Nerland's Noel, A, he was getting better at Kentucky, but at his second year at Kentucky, he wouldn't have been putting up better numbers than Alex Land. I think he would have. Yeah. Well, I don't – put it this way. I mean, you've done a really good job of breaking down how there are six – the top six – Nobody really separates from anybody else in that top six. Like you could kind of make a case for each guy to some degree. I think the yeah. high upside picks are Oladipo and Noel, but um, I'm not always for this philosophy, but I think this year um, you draft by need and what you need as a team. 
more than what the who the best player is or what the right pick is. And I just keep looking at Cleveland and you know, they have one of the top ten blue chip players you can have in the league right now, Kyrie, considering his age and his talent. And you have a chance to build around him. They have Waiters and Tristan Thompson, who are two nice young players. They have all this cap space. They have the chance, who the hell knows, with LeBron in a year. You never know if he's coming back. And I just want to make sure I get somebody who's a guaranteed guy for me with this pick. And that would be my next. Like, if I'm if Orlando had the number one pick, I would say they should take Nerlens Noel. Because they're rebuilding. They have to take a swing. Why not? You know? They um, will. And they will. Right. They will take Noel at two. He's not slipping past number two in this draft. And Orlando shouldn't. will draft him at two. And he shouldn't. And really, what probably makes the most sense is these two teams just flipping picks. And I, I tweeted this a couple weeks ago. I, I think Noel should end up in Orlando and Old Depot should end up in Cleveland. If 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 everybody was making sense, this would that would be the right move. And um what's interesting is Washington at number three, um I'm not sure what they do with that pick. You can make a case they should trade it. I know Mark Stein reported today there was a little low dang for the number three buzz. That does not seem like enough for the number three pick. But uh, that, I'm, I do feel like there's a chance they'll trade that. What are you hearing about that? Anything? I, I think they are. I, and, and by the way, if New Orleans Noel is taken number one by Cleveland, I think there's a great chance that Orlando trades this pick. I still think that there's a, a good chance that Cleveland trades out of the number one pick. I, I mean, this is going to be, you know, trying to get an accurate mock draft is going to be an absolute nightmare uh, given all the trade talks. Washington absolutely is looking at this. They would like with Dane on board uh, and, you know, they have their young players and John Wall and Bradley Bill. I think their ideal scenario is to add another veteran and make a push for the playoffs next year. They like Otto Porter. They like Anthony Bennett. Uh, quite a bit out of UNLV. They have needs at both of those positions. But I think they're looking at this and saying, who's the guy who could help us push us to the playoffs next year? And I think like so many teams, they look at Otto Porter, they look at Anthony Bennett and say, they're nice players. I don't see him playing in the playoffs. I don't see us playing in the playoffs next year if they're starting on my team. And mm-hmm. uh, and so I, I think Lou L. Dang, it, if he wasn't in the last year of his contract, maybe I could swallow that a little bit more. I don't think you give up the number three pick in the draft for a player that you can lose in free agency in a year. Uh, and I, you know, but but look, Chicago has more assets. They have their pick this year. They own the pick that Charlotte has. It's protected the next couple of years, but it's a pretty valuable pick given that I think we all believe the Bobcats will have the worst record in the league for the next five years. Uh, right. Next 15. And, and so Chicago has assets that they could give Washington. Would you trade Jimmy Butler for the number three pick? No. Uh, and I love Jimmy Butler. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I, I'm not that down on the draft. I, don't, I think Jimmy Butler is great. Uh, but I think the upside to these young guys coming in is is so much higher. I, I wouldn't. but. I wouldn't either, but the but what's funny is the Bulls fans would all have a heart attack if the Bulls did that. They'd much rather trade low dang, which I think is interesting. Um Otto Porter some red flags for me with him. Dang. One is the fact that he is, you know, he's getting this best small forward in the draft rep, which he is. But sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be a really good pick. It just means there are no other good small forwards, right? Sure. That makes me nervous. Um, okay. I wonder, Jalen always judges these guys by can you shoot, can you dribble, and can you pass? I watched Otto Porter, and I wonder I wonder like how he's going to score in the pros easily. Because I, I watch him, and it almost feels like he feels Tayshaun Princey to me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I want to take Tayshaun Prince with the third pick in an NBA draft. I don't think that Tayshaun Prince is a bad comp. I, I think you're probably right. I think that he's a pretty good passer for a guy his size. He's a pretty good dribbler for a guy his size. and I'd say he's just a solid shooter for a player his size. And so he doesn't have that one part of his game that really stands out like, yes, this is his NBA skill. He may be but the Chad, most that, that, that makes me nervous, Chad. 
Chad, that makes yeah, me yeah. nervous because we we I, I mean that. we've talked about this so many years. Like you have to be able to do that one thing. I want to know what yeah. the one thing you bring to the table is that is the elite thing. Because if you don't have it, history says you're going to have a pretty forgettable career for the most part. I uh, I hear you. I I don't think that Tayshawn Prince in this draft. I think that's calibrating your expectation. You know, I, I hear this all the time. Well, that guy's not a number one pick. Well, or that guy's not a lottery pick. Okay, fair enough. And a great draft. You're right. But look at the two, you know, we just redrafted the 2003 NBA draft. And yeah. David West was the fifth best player in that draft. Uh, mm. And you can make a good argument for, you know, but, you know, David West coming out of his Xavier, you and I probably on a draft broadcast would say, well, David, David West good, but, you know, he's not a top five pick in the draft. Uh, and, you know, then you go down from there. You have Kirk Heinrich and Chris Kamen and, you know, guys like that who have had, you know, solid NBA careers that are, aren't anything to get super excited about. I mean, that's a draft. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, all these superstars aren't, aren't sitting there in this draft. And so if you told me Tayshawn Prince, is is going to be who Otto Porter is. I'm not sure that there's other players in this draft that will have better careers than Tayshaun Prince did. I think that's like a best case scenario for him. I don't I don't even know if he gets to Tayshaun Prince because I don't know if he's going to be able to defend as well. You know? Yeah, I think there, I think there's some concerns. Doesn't quite have that length and and quite the mobility that Tayshaun did. Um, he's he's got a high basketball IQ. He's an unselfish player. Uh, yeah. He makes guys around him better. Uh, he he can help you in a way. He doesn't need to shoot the ball 20 points a night to help your team. And I will say this one last caveat. Like UCLA, Georgetown's Princeton offense tends to hide people uh, a little bit in the pros. Uh, the way they play doesn't isn't really the way they play in the NBA. And, and sometimes stats don't quite look the same. Uh, because of that. And, uh, you know, I like, Porter. I think part of my problem with Porter is I like him as a person. I like him as a, as an unselfish team first winner. Mm -hmm. And, and I like that he's six, nine and he's, and he's, and he has a lot of skills, but you were right. The red flag for me is the simple one we just talked about. What's the one thing you do to make a living on in the NBA? And when it gets to auto Porter, I don't know the answer to that. And here's the other problem, which we didn't mention. This is turning into a league where you cannot play that position unless you can make threes. You can't stay on the floor. And right. as the as the playoffs went along, the three point shooting, I call them DTA guys, right? These wing guys, defense, threes, athleticism. Those are the three things you want from that position. Kawhi Leonard is perfect. Um, Memphis, uh, Memphis couldn't advance to the finals because. They didn't have the wing guys. Their guys couldn't shoot. San Antonio was playing 12 feet off of Tony Allen and Tayshaun Prince. They had to play Quincy Pondexter for huge minutes in playoff games because he was the only guy who could shoot and create space for their big guys. So if Otto Porter can't shoot, and I know he made, I think, 42% from three at Georgetown, but he wasn't taking a lot. He was taking like three a game. If he, if he can't make threes, if that's beyond his range, on top of the fact that he doesn't have that one special thing, then now we're talking about a potential bust. Um, so you're, you're drafting him, keeping your fingers crossed that this guy will turn into a three point shooter. Cause if he doesn't, we, we just watched the whole season where those guys don't play anymore. It's too hard to win if you, if your win guys can't shoot threes. Now this is why Ben McLemore is somebody that, um, looks so sexy. When you, when you look at like, oh, what does these guys bring to the table? Because you look at him, you're like, oh, I get it. This is a guy who will be a two guard who can shoot threes and get to the rim. Like, I've seen those guys succeed. What are the issues with him? Why are people worried about him? Well, a couple of things. He can't really get to the rim because he can't dribble. And Oh, that's a and, problem. And, and a lot of the issues that he faced at Kansas that looked like him being passive were because defenses you know, Tim Hardaway Jr., I was talking to him because he had to guard both Ben McLemore and Oladipo. He had to guard Oladipo twice. Uh, Michigan played them twice, and, he, and he, they played against Kansas. And I asked him, you know, wh who he thought the better player was between the two. He saw them both up 
close on the court. Tim Hardaway Jr. also has great basketball IQ. Obviously, he knows what he's talking about. And he said, you know, Oladipo was so much tougher for him because, he, you know, you had to guard him everywhere on the floor. He was going to sneak in and get an offensive rebound. He was going to post that. He, he'll, he'll take the ball wherever he can go on the floor. He moves great without the ball. You know, Ben, it was basically what you had to do was make sure that you didn't give him room to shoot his jump shot. Uh, and you didn't let him cut to the basket for an alley-oop. He's not going to beat you off the dribble. Okay? He, but, he, just, you know, he was a power forward in high school. He, that's what he was. Uh, and that part of his game just hasn't come along yet. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when you, if you watch the, the clips of him, and there's some great stuff on the Internet, like on a two-on-one fast break, he looks awesome. But you don't see a lot of footage of... Here's Ben McLemore working off a pick. Oh, watch him go baseline and do this up and under reverse layup. Like, it's basically just him jacking shots, unless they're on a fast break. Um, on the other hand, he's young. You know, and I think he, he was on a he's team. Not as, you, young you, as, he's not as young as you think, though. He was a redshirt freshman. He, you know, he's 20 going on 21. When does he turn 21? Oh, not man, for a while. Me for his birthday. No, no, no. He's, he just turned 20. I think... Um, he's still young for a two guard, but you watched him at Kansas. I mean, why you watched Kansas's, uh, your, your college team. Um, yeah, I watched every game. I always felt with him, you know, he, he always took heat for never taking over and he was too passive, all that stuff. And it was a tough team to play on, right? You have all those seniors. I, I, I don't know. I don't hold that stuff against them. Did you hold it against them? I will look, and this may be the biggest problem I have with Michael Moore is that I'm a Kansas fan. Um, I'm, you know, open about it, and I watched every game that he played. Uh, I don't know that I can stay tough when you have your coach begging you to take shots. When you have your coach in your ear, you're the best player on the team. We need you. We need you to step up. Don't, don't fade away. And with Ben, this is what I saw, and you know, maybe, maybe people can disagree with me on this, but what I saw with Ben was if. The first or second half, if his first couple of shots went in, then you were going to have it. He was going to have a great half. And if those first couple of shots went out, uh, his confidence was going to disappear, and he was going to disappear. And, uh, you know, the great shooters, people comparing to Ray Allen, you know, Ray Allen can miss 10 shots in a row, and he's always been like this. And he believes the 11th shot's going in. Right? Right. And, uh, that to me is the big difference between uh, someone like a, uh, a, a Macklemore. But I really like him because when you tell me his shot is beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful. He has perfect form and rotation on his jump shot. He's an elite athlete. And usually when you put those two great things together, you're talking about a guy who's a special player. But then what he lacks is that it factor. He doesn't have that Oladipo intensity. He doesn't have that drive. He doesn't have that killer instinct. He doesn't quite have the work ethic. He's got to be pushed a lot more um, by the coaches to do things. Uh, and that, that's what scares me with him. And, uh, I, you know, I wonder, will he be Mike Miller? It's funny. The, you know, the, the guy who screwed up that stuff for everybody is Rudy Gay because he was like, Oh, Rudy Gay's got a low motor. He doesn't assert himself. And then he heard it so much, it actually inadvertently kind of helped his pro career a little bit. And he, he probably overachieved because all he heard about was that he didn't care and he couldn't assert himself. And I wonder if maybe this will help Macklemore. He seemed, when we interviewed him, he seemed, he seemed young to me. Like, you know, he, I, I wouldn't call him polished. Um, it, like it was like, out of all the kids we interviewed, he was the one that felt most like a kid, if that makes sense. Well, it, look it, at his background, and you know why. Right. Um, I mean, he's he's had as hard a life as anyone. Yes. Look, I refer to him as sweet. He is a humble, sweet, naive young man uh, yeah. who doesn't lack maturity. Sometimes that's a code word for. They're out doing drugs and partying all night. He's not that type of player at all. He's not right. that type of kid at all. He lacks maturity, and he doesn't know how the world works. He doesn't know what it's going to take 
at the NBA level to achieve. He, does, he doesn't understand that the guys that he's going to be playing against every night don't just show up at the game and play basketball. Um, you know, you've heard LeBron at the end of the game talking about going back and continuing to improve and work on his games. These guys are driven. The great ones are driven to be the best. And you see Ben and his biggest knock against him the last couple of months is he's out of shape. He hasn't been working on his game. Uh, he's not, he's not in there playing basketball every day. You know, all the depot guaranteed the minute he gets off a plane, even if he doesn't work out that day, he's trying to find a gym. Uh, to go in and work on. And, and that's just the maturity issue. I don't think it means he's lazy. It means who's going to take him and take him under his wing and, and tell him, this is what you have to be to be uh, a professional. This is who you have to be. You didn't have to tell that to Kawhi Leonard or Oladipo. They were, they were driven internally anyway. Someone's going to have to teach that to, Ola, uh, to Macklemore. And he's such a good kid, he might get it. But I'm concerned about the people that are around him. Mm. deeply concerned um, well, that he might ever get that advice. And Jalen, after, you know, Jalen obviously grew up poor and it's something that he notices when he meets certain people. Cause he can tell he, it's weird. He, he can like meet just about anybody from the inner city and kind of figure out how they were raised to some degree. And he met after we talked to him, Jalen was like, wow, you know, that I could, I could feel that kid's background, like, you know, and then I researched after the fact and was like, yeah, he had it grew up with a really tough life and you could kind of feel it. And, um, when, it, for somebody like that, it becomes so essential where they get drafted, who's on that team. Jalen played with Eddie Curry and Tyson Chandler when they were, um, rookies in the Bulls, you know, and it's like, you take somebody from, from from that to the NBA, and they don't have the right people, the right coach, the right veterans, the right support circle. Like a lot of things can go wrong, um, and, I, and that's why for him, I, even though Phoenix makes a ton of sense for him, they need a shooting guard. They could build around him. I worry about that team for him because I think he'd have a lot of expectations early. Right? He'd get a lot of shots, a lot of pressure. People would think he was, you know, this is going to be our guy. He's our scorer. And I'm not, I'm not sure that would be a great situation for him. I don't think Charlotte would be a good situation for him either. Oh, um, the worst, probably. The yeah. Worst. So for him, I, I, I really hope he gets drafted by the right team because I really liked him. I, I thought he seemed like such a sweet kid. And I just hope that he ends up in the right place. Um, I, I did too. I wish him the best. I, I think he's such a great young man. It's a great story that he's got out of yes. it. Everything you said, I deeply agree with. And I, it also makes sense, while well, despite the talent, why a team might hesitate to pull the trigger on him with the number one pick in the draft. Because I think people are confused. Because Macklemore looks the part more than any of these guys look the part uh, as the future all-star, as the number one guy. And I think when you understand all that background, you understand why teams are hesitant to pull the trigger and put that pressure and put all of those expectations on him because I think mentally he's the least equipped to handle. But here's a good example. The the Dodgers had that Cuban baseball player that just came up and he, and he started hitting home runs right away and became a little bit of a phenomenon. And, you know, Magic's one of the owners of the team, and he was telling us about as soon as this kid, his career started to tick off a little bit, you know, they sprung into action. All right, we have to get a little – circle around him. They hired the guy who used to hang out with Kobe when Kobe was on the Lakers the first few years to just kind of be his, the person who hangs out with him all the time and watches over him. And they just put this support circle in place to make sure here's a kid who can barely speak English. Who's hasn't been in the country that long, has all this stuff getting thrown at him and they just want to make sure he handled it. Okay. And what I think people don't realize about sports and especially professional sports is a lot of times the franchises just don't have that infrastructure in place and they don't put the thought into it. And they think of these guys as just these commodities that they picked and not human beings. And um, this is something the league's starting to get better at. And I think David Stern and Adam Silver have made it a priority. But from a franchise to franchise basis, it's still lacking. And that's why, you know, we talk about somebody like Oladipo. He could go anywhere. He's going to be fine. Like, don't worry right. about that kid. Um, but 
you know, I think New Orleans Noel is, is another, I know the Cal Paris said nice stuff about him, but he, he has similar concerns about maybe some of the people that are around him, people he grew up with, people that have been attached to him. Um, and that's somebody else that depending on what team he goes to, um, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to turn out for him, but you, do you feel like it's funny in the 2003 year old draft, um, the Dumar said that quote about the one thing we learned from the, that draft and Darko was how important character research was and background research and just being totally prepared for anything. This was something teams didn't even really think about 10 years ago, right? They thought about it. They don't go about it to the extent that they go about it now, uh, where they hire professional investigators, uh, where they are spending the entire season collecting information, talking to the ball boys, talking to everybody about what do you know about this kid? What have you seen? Um, they've gotten much more professional in the last 10 years for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Joe's, Joe's right. That's, that's a big factor. Now it's interesting. Some GMs like, you know, I don't think Danny Ainge cares so much. Uh, when you look at some of the guys that he's drafted over the years, yeah, yeah I think some guys, and, and maybe it tends to go towards more ex players, look at this and say, look, you know, there's a lot of messed up guys in the league. You can either play or you can't play. And, and that's it. And I think other teams, man, they really look at that now and it's such a big deal for them. Character, culture, you know, all of those things. But look, Larry Bird drafted Lance Stevenson. Yeah. You want to talk about a guy that had red flags. They were everywhere. Uh, he was the Russia of red flags. Uh, <laughs> you know, Lance Stevenson. But, I will say this, Larry Bird looked at him and said, look, this guy can play and on a talent level. He's one of the best players in this draft. And two, then what the Indiana did, David Morley, Clark Kellogg, all of these guys, they got together and they had a plan about how they were going to help Lance Stevenson transition from who he was to who he needed to be. And, you know, he should, uh, be high fiving and sending ten percent of his paychecks for the rest of his career to Indiana because they did it. They helped him, and now everybody look, looks at Lance Stevenson and says, "Man, he can play." Uh, but you want to talk about you know character and every red flag in the book. Well, that there that's one of the reasons he fell to thirty nine or forty or wherever he, he got drafted. I think it, 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 yeah. when you're when you're in the top ten, it gets the the risks are bigger because. It's just so hard to recover from blowing a, a pick that high, even in a draft like this when, as you said, it's a deeper draft. It's not necessarily a top-heavy draft. I, I would say, other than Noel, the most fascinating um, prospect from an upside standpoint, I think this is one of the few times we've used the word upside today. I'm proud of us. Uh, Alex Len. Now, I, first of all, I thought he was pretty impressive when when we talked to him and um, I like the fact that he used to be a gymnast. I thought it was interesting. I've, I've liked all the video I've watched. Like he's pretty agile. He's not, definitely not a stiff. If you, if you're poking holes at like, what's, you know, what are his weaknesses? Like he doesn't really have any glaring weaknesses other than that, you know, the rebounding maybe, which is something that, uh, you know, you, you either can rebound or you can't. It's not, it's not like he was out there having these 20 rebound games or anything. But for the most part, the stress fracture is the one big red flag. And it looks like he was playing hurt to some degree for the second half of the year. How did that factor into how these teams are trying to evaluate him? It was tough to evaluate both his freshman and sophomore years because the biggest reason was that Maryland had no guard play. And Len just didn't catch the, you know, big men depend on their guard to get them the ball in the right position to score. And you couldn't depend on Maryland's guards to do that at all. And, uh, you know, if you watch a lot of game film of him, you see him get proper position, back his guy down on the block, not get the ball, have the guard shooting a fadeaway three instead, um, picking and popping out onto the floor into the right position and not getting the ball, uh, and so, and then Len would get frustrated at times, and the body language wasn't always so great. 
And, you know, I think, you know, all of that psychologically is hard to untangle sometimes because everybody says, well, you know, Alex Lynn is so much better scorer than Noel. He averaged 11.8 points a game. Noel had 10.4. Um, you know, uh, Noel averaged more assists per game than Len did. Noel shot a better from two point field goals than Len did. Uh, and what you see now, but that's, that's the negative. What you see is the potential that this seven foot one guy has. He runs the floor well, he rebounds, he blocks shots, maybe not at the level of a Nerlens Noel, but, but very good for his position. When you watch him in the international competition against players that are his peers on a team that understood he was the best player on the floor and got him the ball, he was dominant. Mm. And, uh, you know, that says something uh, to me as well. The only Reminds me, remember Derek, is, Favors at, uh, remember Derek Favors at Georgia Tech when he didn't have any guards? I think there's a very similar equation there. Uh, you know, we're three years into the Derek Favors, uh, you know, career and you're, you see it, but you're still not a hundred percent sure where it's going to go, um, or how, you know, how far he's going to go. Um, I think some people, including me thought he might even be further along than he's been uh, in his career, given the, the, the obvious talent that he has. I think Lynn, Lynn is a legitimate pick with the number one pick. If the Cavs did it, Personally, I think they should take Noel over him. But if they did it, I wouldn't bat an eye. Uh, and I could make the argument in their favor uh, that Lynn was a safer prospect. Stress fracture scares me a little bit, though. Me too. Uh, you know, everybody's worried about ACL. You know, big men, stress fracture. That, to me, is a little bit scarier injury. Especially with the number one pick in the same Bowie history. It's interesting on our draft tracker. It's got uh, your player evaluation for for Alex Len, just like the bullet points. Skilled big man, good touch around the basket, solid perimeter game, nice passer out of the post, good shot blocker and rebounder, good athlete for a player of size. Those were all his positives. Yeah. Now, that's basically you just described every single thing I would want from a big man. Yeah. Do you, um, you know who else I would have given that that exact? I was just talking with this with Royce Weber, editor, the other day. You know what, who else I would have given the same same things said the same things about, and in fact, who Alex Len reminds me of when uh, I watch him play? Who? Want to take one wild guess? A right-handed Darko? Darko, uh, uh, Darko Milicic, mm. as a young player, reminds me a lot. And you know, the one thing about Darko was that sometimes, why didn't he show up? Why wasn't he there in this game? Why did he disappear? And there's lots of excuses that you can give yourself about why and, you know, the team he was on or the coach or the, you know, guards or what have you. I don't know. Now, I will say this. I, I Meeting Alex Lynn, personality-wise, they're different. And that may just have been the ultimate thing um, with Darko Milicic. Uh, and, you know, that's one thing that I like about your job. What is it? What do you call that thing on Grant Line? Your job The interview? job interview. Yeah, the NBA job interview. I, I think this is one of the most important things that we've done Thank because you. I don't think I, I don't think our fans of Fall the Draft understand how big a deal this is for teams to get to know these players and understand who they are as people, how much it affects their evaluation of them. Because remember, they're banned from contact with these players until they declare for the draft. Yep, they're banned. They can't talk to these guys. They can talk to other people about them, but they don't get to meet them. They don't get to uh, feel them out at all as, as, as for people. And this is something you're going to commit millions of dollars to in a multi-year guaranteed contract, and you're going to risk your own job security as a general manager on this human being coming in and being able to nail those interviews. And I think it's a huge deal. It's always been a big deal for me when I go to Chicago to sit down and talk with these guys and I just think I think your video series captures that in a way that I think you know if you like so and so in the draft, you want to watch that video clip and make sure you still like them. Thank uh, you. I mean, that was one of our goals was to to try to put them in a situation where they would be themselves and not the person who had just been coached by their agent and their two coaches and their media trainer how to answer questions. Because and I did feel like. 
with each guy, the true flavor of their personality came out, whatever it was. And it was fascinating. Like when we did Shabazz and we asked him about the age thing, the way he handled the response, I wasn't crazy about it. I, he actually made me feel worse about that situation than I did before I had the interview. Um, he, he basically kind of passed it off on other people and didn't take responsibility for it. It made me think like, wow, this guy's still not taking, like at this point, you just got to own it because you had to know that your age was out there and it was the wrong age and you didn't do anything about it. So at some point that's not somebody else's fault. That's your fault that you didn't say anything. Um, and then on the flip side, somebody like CJ McCollum, who we met that guy, I would have, I, I would hire that guy for Grantland. Right. I'd make him like our, I, whatever job he'd want to do, I'd bring him in. We could play basketball with him. He could write. Like I, he was just fantastic. And, um, you know, this is where like it's, it's weird to think of him as the seventh pick, but that could be the next Jason Terry. Like he and he, when we, when we redo this draft in 10 years, he might be one of the best five guys from this draft. And then you think about how he handled himself and what a good guy he is. Um, and how polished and mature he is. And it's like, it'd be pretty hard for this guy to fail. Worst case scenario would be like a better Eddie house or something like that. But, um, CJ McCollum, Michael Carter Williams, Trey Burke, all of them are on the board and you need a guard. Who are you taking? Man, it depends on my team. I mean, really, you're talking about three players that play very differently. Uh, and it depends on what else I've got. Like if I'm the Detroit Pistons, and I'm moving Brandon Knight to the two, which it sounds to me like that's what they want to do. They think he's better there. He can shoot the three. He can defend. He's long. Uh, I, I need a big guard. If yep. He's 6'3". I need a big guard, and I'm moving him off because he's really a two guard in the body of a point guard. So I need a guy who's going to get Andre Drummond, lobs at the basket, uh, get him involved offensively and Greg Monroe, I probably pick Carter Williams because I think he sees the I think he sees the floor better than the other guys that are out there. If I need my point guard to score the basketball, I pick CJ McCollum, who was one of my top five players personally in the in the draft. I love Damian Lillard last year. There's so many similarities. I don't think they're the same type of player, but so many similarities in what how I think they're going to be able to translate small school success to the NBA. And Burke is a hybrid. You know, Burke does a little bit of everything. He sees the floor. He can score a little bit. I just don't love small point guards who aren't elite athletes. Uh, You know, that combination of those two together scare me a little bit about Trey Burke. If he was a little bit quicker, or a little bit taller, he would clearly be the number one pick in the draft. But when you start going back and look at those database points, it's a little scary to find a six-foot point guard who doesn't move that well laterally. And that's what scares me about him. Yeah. I, I'm i a Trey Burke guy, and I think the best thing that could happen to him in this draft is him going five spots later than he thinks he's going to go. Cause he already has a chip on his shoulder. He, he talked does. about it when we interviewed him. And I think he's getting mad this past week because initially people were talking about, Oh, he might go number two. Oh, you could see him go fourth. Now he's starting to slide out of that. He's out of the top six. Now you're talking about Michael Carter Williams might go ahead of him. McCollum might go ahead of him. He might slip to 11 or 12. And if that happens, I think that would be the best thing that ever happened to that guy. I think he would be mad. I think he would play mad. I think he would do everything he could to shove it in people's faces. My my fear with him isn't a basketball thing. Um, I worry about the way he plays and him getting hurt. And I said this to him when we interviewed him. Um, I thought he took really hard falls. Every time I watch Michigan, and we, we would always have them on because we're always doing basketball shows, and Jalen's a Michigan fan, obviously. Um, I just thought he took hard falls. He bounces off people in not the right way. Like, uh, you know, somebody like Chris Paul would bounce off somebody, but he keeps his balance, especially big guys when you're in the paint. Trey Burke would bounce off a power forward. He would go flying. Like, he'd go into the cameras. And uh, I just, I worry about that with him. But it, it, I forget who's picking, like, uh, 
like the a team like the Sixers or like think about like Trey Burke going to the Thunder at number twelve. Now that would be interesting. It a would. pissed they off got Trey Burke Jackson there as a as a backup who's pretty good, probably underrated, but yeah. Uh, and look, Utah would be maybe his dream scenario in that he might start. And when you look at all those young players around him, uh. Uh, you know, I think he'd be a good fit there, and they want their point guards to shoot the basketball in Utah. That's a big, big deal for them, mm. and I think Burke can do that. I, I love Burke, but I, I will say this: the thing that scares me a little bit about Burke, uh, in addition to what I said, there's a history of guys who rise in March. Yep. Uh, based off of team success combined with individual success, and it almost never looks good. He was ranked by NBA guys as a mid first round to late first round pick the entire year until the end when, you know, he led Michigan to the championship game. Go back, watch the game. Obviously, he ripped my heart out by uh, beating Kansas with a huge, you know, a huge shot that won that game. Uh, but, you know, go watch the Syracuse game and, you know, other games. You know, Trey Burke wasn't dominant in the. NCAA tournament. Right. Uh, he, he had several very difficult games um, there. But Michigan was winning. Burke has moxie. He has that He has that charisma on the court. But I love in a point guard, you know, that I'm the best guy on the floor. I'm the leader. He has that about him. And his stock went through the roof. And... He's- and I, I, I worry when I go back and look at my big boards and I watch guys who take huge leaps in March, that it's, it's usually not pretty. The interview process will really help them. Um, Contavious Caldwell Pope, who, who, who randomly joined the top 10 a few weeks ago and, uh, and seems like this guy that, uh, you know, you know what he is. He can shoot. Teams always like shooters. Always have a place for a shooter on your team. Uh, a lot of people have him going to Minnesota at number nine. Played at Georgia. Certainly not somebody I watched a ton of times. Um, in any other draft, he would be like, what, the 19th, 20th pick? How, how does right. somebody like him get in the top 10? I think, you know, he was an interesting one. I don't think a lot of scouts watched him a lot this year because no, Georgia didn't have anybody else on their team. It was all Caldwell Pope. His freshman season, it, it hurt him even more. His shooting percentage was way down. He was a freshman trying to carry the whole team himself, and he's really not that, that type of player. He's more of a, you know, kind of a Rip Hamilton type of player, long, lanky, you know, shoots the ball, reads screens well, comes off screens well. Uh, and this year, the thing that caught my eye was he was winning games for Georgia. Even though they weren't winning a lot of games, when they were winning, he was he was figuring it out. He was taking it over, and you know he averaged 18 points a game when defenses every single night in the SEC were geared towards stopping one guy. So this isn't CJ McCollum in the Patriot League uh, having you know Patriot League defenses trying to stop him every night. These are SEC defenses trying to stop him every night. And you look at some of the efficiency numbers and what he did, and a lot of the advanced analytics stuff say this guy was better than Macklemore. Uh, he was better than Oladipo. Uh, as, a, as a two guard, we just missed it because he was playing on Georgia on a really, really bad team, and he wasn't playing in the tournament. And we didn't you know, see him go deep in the SEC uh, tournament. And I think when teams went back and they watched the tape, and they looked at what this guy was doing with very little around him. It's impressive. And I don't think he'll be a superstar in the league, but I think he's maybe the most underrated player in the draft just because he didn't get the attention that he deserved because of the team that he was on. I also think he's your best candidate. I think the top six is going to be the top six in some order. The only one who might fall out is Macklemore, but I don't see it. I think New Orleans at six will take whoever just falls out of that top six to six. Um, the Kings are at seven. I think he could go there. I, I think, I think the could. Kings are a wild card. I'm prepared for anything with the Kings anyway, just from their history. They might actually have people who know what they're doing now uh, running it. We'll see. But I, I, I – 
people have point guards tied to them. That team's been taking point guards and hybrid guards for the for the last hundred years. I think uh I could see him going there and, and if the Kings make a weird pick, this whole draft will get weird. The other the other wild card pick, this kid from Pittsburgh, Steven Adams, who grew up uh in New Zealand, nineteen nineteen years old, turns twenty next month. Um he's this year's quote unquote energy guy off the bench. Um seven point two points last year for Pittsburgh. Hard to get really excited about this guy, but yet he's creeped into the top 12. What's happening with him? Did you interview him? No, we didn't get to interview him. Uh, oh, Bill, you would have had him on your podcast. Uh, this guy is hilarious. He's got that Kiwi sort of wit, that sort of British wit. Yeah. He's, he's a crack up. I mean, teams were coming out of, his, out of their interviews with him chuckling uh, at the interview. He's very candid. He, he doesn't know this whole drill about how things are supposed to be perceived or said. He'll say just about anything. Uh, and, and so that's one thing. He absolutely charmed everyone that he went to work out with. And when you look at him, he doesn't look like that type of guy that would do yeah. that. And it's, it's a little bit, a little bit surprising when you talk to him. You, you love him. You gotta, gotta call him up. Uh, and then the second thing that happened was he's on Jamie Dixon's team in Pittsburgh. At the start of the season, he looks like he's never played basketball before. Uh, I mean, he looked that lost on the floor, and you were like, oh, my goodness, this guy is like, maybe we can come back and review him his junior year. Uh, he just doesn't know what he's doing out there. But his learning curve was really steep throughout the season. And by the end of the season, he was already a guy who looked like he could dominate on the defensive end. And even his offensive game was really starting to come along uh, to the point that you're like, wow, that was a huge curve, in-season curve for him. Then he goes to the draft combine, and he starts hitting all of his jumpers. Wow. And he's hitting all yeah, soft touch on the shot. He's hitting from everywhere. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait, man, maybe this guy's a little bit more skilled than we thought. Then he's gone into workouts, and he's done the same thing. When he's been playing three-on-three. Three, and two on two in these workouts, he's been amazing. I think people feel like he's played he hasn't played organized basketball enough to have a great feel. And he's kind of like a step slow, if you know what I mean. Like his reaction yeah. time is just like a, a step slow. Um, because he's still trying mentally to figure out what's happening on the court around him. But he has all the physical tools. He's a great kid, he's a hard worker. And as he gets and develops, he's a perfect candidate to go to the D League and just play in a ton of minutes and getting used to playing basketball more and more. I, I think he could be one of the skills of the draft. Well, it's funny. So there's really like 10. We know there's a top 10. And then there's Cody Zeller. And then there's Steven Adams. And then there's a drop-off. And from from that 12 to whatever else, now, we, now the draft turns into something else. And... All the teams that are picking basically are, aren't going to be contender threats next year, except for the Thunder at number 12. And I think the most fascinating part of this whole draft, other than what Cleveland does, and actually what New Orleans does at six, because they're another team that I think could go in about 40 different directions. But if somehow a good player falls to the Thunder at 12, that would at least soften the blow a little bit from the James Harden trade, which I still think is one of the worst basketball trades of all time. But at least if they can come out of this with, you know, somebody that was supposed to be a top six guy who fell to 12, they could feel a little bit better about this. I think I would think their worst case scenario would be Cody Zeller being there at 12 and then a drop. Yeah, I think, and actually, I think that'd be good for Cody Zeller if he landed there. I think that's a good team for him. Uh, I I, they're not nothing that nothing in this draft is going to stop the blow of losing James Harden. No. And, and I think the most likely scenario that you're going to see Oklahoma City and what I think you're going to see next in the draft is a run on all these international guys. You're going to see a run on Sergey Karasev. You're going to see a run on Lucas Nogueta, Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, out of Greece. Uh, My dude. You're going to see Rudy Gobey. Uh, you're going to just uh, uh, Dennis Schroeder, the German kid who some people reminds them of, of Rondo. You're just going to see a run on those guys because – you might be able to stash him overseas for a year. You don't, you know, you know this class isn't great, and those guys, you know, maybe they have some upside that has been obscured by playing internationally. 
I think that'll be the really interesting part of the draft. The teams are going to be filled with names of people that you can't pronounce. And I think all those international guys will be off the board by 20. And, uh, and I was, I, the Thunder, I could see taking a guy like that. Dallas, uh, taking a guy like that. Uh, Boston's thinking about taking a guy like that. Um, Atlanta has two picks back to back. I guarantee you one of those is going to be an international player. They don't want 17 and 18 in this draft. And, uh, you know, that's, look, all those guys, by the way, are intriguing. It's uh, funny. Remember I, when? Remember when people were worried there were no international players in this draft? All of a sudden, there are international players. There's international players, and there's going to be ones next year as well. And the best one isn't even in this draft this year. Sorry, she pulled out. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be the run that you're going to see. That's going to be the second theme of the draft. So there's going to be those six, and then, in my opinion, there's another five, maybe another five guys in some sort of order. And then there's going to be a run on international players. And then there's going to be a free for all for everybody else that's left. The big, the Tim Hardaway juniors, the Gordy Jangs of the world, the Mason Plumleys, uh, you know, the, all those guys, Kelly Olenek, they're all, and I, I don't know how you rank all those guys. They're, they're all sort of the same. Well, and the other point you didn't mention, which you've, you've written about is, if you're close to the luxury tax or over the luxury tax, you're better off stashing one of these guys over drafting somebody who's going to be your 11th man, locking them into a guaranteed contract, which will actually be worth more than that contract because of the luxury tax. Um, you could stash somebody. You don't have to pay them until they come over. So for a team like Oklahoma City, that's pretty worried about the luxury tax. Maybe that's what they'll do. But hey, listen, I find all NBA drafts interesting. I think this one's going to be interesting. I love the fact that we have no idea who the number one pick's going to be. And I really hope I they keep us into the dark until uh, it's, you know who the number one pick's going to be. No, I said I don't. I don't love that we don't know who the number one pick in the draft is. Uh, it makes it a lot harder for me to forecast what's going to happen next. I mean, you know, you're right. Those six guys go in some order, but man, predicting the order right now is really, really tough. And New Orleans is probably they'll just be happy with any of the six. They'll figure it out. I'm sure. Um, Sacramento at seven. Yet again, the Kings fans get screwed. Anyway, Chad Ford, go do more media. I will see you in Brooklyn for the NBA draft. It's Thursday night, 7.30 ESPN. Our draft preview shows are on 7 o'clock uh, Thursday night before the draft, but then we have another one on Wednesday night on ESPN as well, so look out for those. Look out for uh, the Grantland Channel stuff, too. We're almost done posting those. And look out for Chad's got at least two more mock drafts in him. You'll get to 7.0, I think. Yeah, yeah, I will. 6.0 right. on Tuesday, 7.0 on Thursday. All right. So and congrats on uh, Andrew Wiggins. I know I know you're still pouring champagne on yourself. I will see you in Brooklyn. All right. Take care, Bill. Bye-bye. Target the sun off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Got to say, Gola, great call on grabbing Subway for lunch and getting guacamole on our subs. Told you this new guac really amps up the flavor. Yep, something adding up things can be great. Guacamole on your sub, a new co-host to replace you. What was that? Oh, no, nothing. Subway now has deliciously rich new guacamole made from ripe house avocados with just a hint of garlic, onion, and jalapeno. Discover how new guacamole turns up the flavor on any of your freshly made favorites. Subway, eat fresh.